morning and it's, it's just not who he is? No, I don't think so. Let's get some context. Jesus and his disciples here are spending the night in Bethany at his friend's house. Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem. It's just a short walk away. And Jesus has been teaching in Jerusalem, staying at his friend's house in Bethany at night. And now he's walking back. And he sees this healthy fig tree. It's full of leaves. It looks healthy, but it has no figs on it. And then he curses it. But the writers of our Mark here, who got his account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and ascension for Peter, have, has this little note. It's not the season for figs. You can't be expecting figs on a tree when it's not the season. Jesus should have known that this tree wouldn't have figs. So why was his response so overly dramatic? Is Jesus just being a diva here, and he's like, I wanted figs, and it's not figs, and I'm just going to kill the tree? No, that's, that's not Jesus, right? That's not what he's doing. Jesus is engaging in guerrilla theater. Guerrilla theater was defined as a movement in the 1960s as Vietnam War protesters in America started to do absurd things to drive attention to their movement, to their rallies, and to their messaging. They would do things like set things on fire. They would go out and have naked protests. They would do anything to try to draw a crowd or do something provocative. And even though this term was coined in the 1960s, humanity has been doing this for a long, long time. Way before the 1960s, humanity has been doing provocative things to get people's attention so they can deliver them a message. I mean, the prophets in the Old Testament were famous for this. Hosea married a prostitute to show Israel how they were cheating on God. Ezekiel cooked food over dung to show Israel how they had become unclean. Jesus is falling into a long tradition of people bringing a prophetic word to God's people by doing something provocative to get their attention. And Jesus is doing that same thing here, this provocative move to drive attention to his message. He's commenting on the condition of God's chosen people, Israel. They were the special people chosen by God, intended to be the platform to announce Jesus' kingship to the world. But instead, they were acting like a fig tree with no figs. And the Old Testament is actually filled with analogies between people and trees. Psalm 1. Verse 3. Does anybody know it? It's not like a tree. Yes, yeah. The righteous are like a tree planted by streams of water. People are like trees. This is actually an image that comes up over and over again in the Bible. The righteous are like a tree planted by streams of water, it says in Psalms 1 3. They yield their fruit in season, their leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prosper. And the idea of directly referring to Israel as a fig tree or making reference to Israel in regard to fig trees is throughout the Old Testament. Take Jeremiah 8.13. I'm going to take away your harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the tree. Your leaves will wither. Or Hosea 9.10. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing early fruit on the fig tree. It was like seeing fruit on the fig tree before it was the season for figs. Or Jeremiah 24, verses 2 to 3. He asked Jeremiah, he's like, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, one basket has good figs, like those that have ripened early before season. The other basket had very bad figs, so bad they could not be eaten. So in these passages, Israel was described as in their best condition, as a fig tree full of early season fruit, and in their worst condition, as a fig tree that never bears figs, or as a fig tree filled with bad figs. Now, does all this talk of figs make anybody hungry for fig newtons? Anybody ever have a fig newton? When I was a kid, I had them all the time. I have not had one as an adult. I bought a bunch of packages back in the kitchen. So if all this talking of figs makes you want to have a fig newton, go back there. Just go get one, Diane. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> After church, take as many food newtons as you want. Jesus here is not just cursing a fig tree, he's making a statement about Israel. Israel, according to all these Old Testament passages, often looks like a healthy tree, but has no edible fruit. They were following all the religious rules, but they weren't becoming people like their God. They looked the part. But they didn't live the part. Healthy trees produce good fruit. And then what does Jesus do right after this? He leaves the tree, he enters into Jerusalem, and finds the temple filled with crooked salesmen, embezzling priests, and the space reserved for Gentiles to worship God, instead housing a temple market. And Jesus clears the temple of these impurities, 
and incurs the wrath of the religious elite. Now, historians tell us that this temple gift shop was set up in the Gentile court. It's a section, if you look at, if we had a projector screen today and this art wasn't in the way, we could pull up a map of um, Second Temple, uh, Israel, and what the, the Second Temple in Jerusalem looked like. And in it was a section that God outlines in Scripture for non-Jewish people to come in and worship God, to experience Yahweh, to get to know God. And the Israelites at this time, they were like, we don't like non-Jews. Those are Romans. We don't want them coming to know our God. We don't want them in our temple. We're going to take the space that's set up for them, and we're going to fill it with something else. We're going to put a temple gift shop in. And what they would do is they would sell sacrifices that were, were required at the temple, but they would sell these sacrifices at a super high price. So you could go outside of Jerusalem and buy a sheep for a really low price, or you could get one at the temple gift shop for a really high jacked up price. And what the priests were doing, historians tell us at this time, is if you came in with a sheep from outside of the city, they'd look at it and they go, no, this isn't a good sheep. You can't sacrifice this to your God. It's not good enough. But if you want one that's good enough, we have one for 10 times the price in our gift shop. Just go ahead and buy that. And they were forcing people and fleecing people who were wanting to encounter God, who were wanting to be obedient to God, who were wanting to draw near to God. There were religious people taking advantage of that, forcing people to pay the highest prices from which they received a cut. And this market literally filled the place where God had designed for non-Jews to come and experience him. In short, the greed of those claiming to serve God had taken away the space for people far from God to encounter him. Now, before we judge them, before we say, man, those ancient Israelites, what were they thinking? The very same argument can be made about the American church today. We're often so worried about attracting the right kind of religious people who attend and give Often we've refused to make space for the messy people who make the religious people feel uncomfortable. Because we're afraid inviting people who need God in would drive away the people who claim to know God who give to fund the church. And so are we really that different than the crooked priests in the temple? Cursing the fig tree was a commentary on Israel. It was Jesus saying, you keep the rules, but you don't live in love like the world maker. You're doing the outward stuff that people see, but not the inward stuff that only God sees. Cleansing the temple was a commentary on how the religious elite used what was intended for good to control and misuse people. And these biting critiques of the religious customs and the power systems that manipulated them ultimately would cost Jesus his life. From this point on, it's a very quick path to the cross. They're like, we've got to get rid of this guy. He's dismantling our power structures. And I think the warning here for us is simple. If you pretend to be fruitful instead of actually being fruitful, you will be exposed. Just like the fig tree looked full and healthy but didn't have figs, and then it showed up next time as a withered tree for what it really was, Jesus reveals who we really are. If you use religious pretense to garner attention, power, or influences, there will be consequences. Tables will be flipped. Roles will be reversed. In the kingdom, the first will be last. Here's Jesus in Matthew, again using the image of the fig tree. Look at Matthew 7, verses 15 through 19. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You will know people by their fruit. Now, whenever I read passages like this in the Bible, I'm like, well, I'm all good. Because I'm, I'm the sheep. I'm not the wolves. I'm the table flipper. I'm not the one sitting at the table. I always assume I'm the good fruit. But what if we aren't? What kind of fruit should we see being produced in our life? Paul continues his tree theme in his letter to the Galatians in uh, Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. He tells them, the Holy Spirit in you will produce fruit like a tree. It's going to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If the Holy Spirit is in us, that is what is produced. 
So what kind of fruit is in your life? Don't just automatically assume, well, it's good. I am a sheep and not a wolf. Take a minute. Think about it. Would Jesus find figs? Or would he find a big, full, leafy tree without any fruit? Too often I see Christians, especially online, who bear the name of Jesus, but are producing fruits of hate, cynicism, anxiety, impatience, cruelty, mockery, treachery, harshness, and fits of rage. And these are the opposite fruits to what the Holy Spirit produces. These are bad fruits. Too often we attend services, we affirm doctrines, we study our Bibles, and yet we treat our neighbors, made in the image of God, as our enemies. So what do we do if we aren't producing fruit? If we're making bad fruit? If we're fighting to sit at tables that Jesus would be fighting to flip? What do we do when we're the wolf and not the sheep? Well, we repent. We repent. We get honest about where we are. We get honest about how we got there. It's not someone's fault. It's not our parents' fault. It's not the environment's fault. It's our fault. And we start taking actions to head in a new direction. So that's a pretty uh, somber promise. We've looked at some really positive promises of God given in and around trees. This one's pretty somber. But it's not the only promise given here, right? Jesus gives us another promise at this tree. Yes, the promise is somber that if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be revealed for what you are. You're going to get pruned. You're going to need to change directions. But there's a second promise here, and that promise is have faith in God. Ask and he will act. Dallas Willard used to say, faith is believing God is good. Jesus is saying, trust me. Trust that I am good. Even when life is bad, trust that I am good. Even when it looks like evil is winning, trust that I am good. Trust that I am the God who resurrects the dead. Not all stories this side of the kingdom have a happy ending, but some stories do. <laughs> some stories that do. And as Jesus would say, have faith in God. Now notice Jesus is making this provocative statement about religious hypocrisy. But what if the disciples are just totally oblivious to it? They're like, it's so cool you killed that tree. Did you see Peter's uh, comment here? Then he's like, Rabbi, the tree's dead. He doesn't care at all about them. Uh, Jesus kicking out the corruption in the temple. He's really excited about the tree being dead. Jesus tells them, forget trees. If you have faith, you can move the very mountain that this tree grows now, no scholar thinks that Jesus is suggesting that we pray and throw uh, mountains around in the air like some souped-up Jedi, you know, who's got really strong force powers, and he's just throwing mountains into the sky. Jesus is almost certainly using an idiom or hyperbole to exaggerate his point. Most scholars think that Jesus is more likely referring to mountainous obstacles rather than actually picking up mountains and moving them around with our faith. In context, Jesus may be implying that belief can change a religious hypocrite, that corrupt priests and corrupt Pharisees and treacherous scribes can become disciples if only they believe. Belief can change any of us from being destructive agents of chaos into disciples, agents of love. Perhaps the biggest mountain is that fruitless wolves can be turned into fruitful sheep. But even if that is true, throughout Jesus' teaching, he often makes mention of unbelief as an obstacle to miracles. And I don't know about you, but I get a little stressed out about that because I have a lot of unbelief. Like, I'm like, oh man, how much miracles am I being held back because I have so much unbelief? And I'm going to tell you right now, I have a miracle here today, and I'm going to tell you that is not because my faith was strong. That's not just because I was like, it's all going to work out. It's great. I know God is good. He's going to do it. I never doubted for a minute. I doubted every second she was God. She is not here because I had faith that was strong enough to move a mountain. She is here because surely by the grace of God, despite my lack of belief, I've given up all hope of a resurrection, all hope of a miracle. Jesus didn't return from the dead because of his disciples' faith. They all gave up. Some went back to their old lives convinced that it was all over. So what is Jesus teaching here? Well, a key, I think, comes in this statement he makes at the end of the passage. And he says, when you pray, when you ask in prayer, whatever Jesus is teaching here seems to be something about 
prayer. Believing that when we pray, that we have a good, generous God that we are speaking to. That we don't need to worry if he's there or if he wants to do good for us. Believing not just that miracles are possible, but as my therapist reminded me this week, for the Christian, miracles are normal. Just as we just remind yourself each morning, if I am a student of how Jesus lived in love, miracles are normal. They're not the exception, they're the rule. They are to be anticipated and expected. And if we examine Jesus' other teachings on prayer, we know we should be asking for God's will on earth. Like, we shouldn't just be like, hey, destroy that mountain with all those people on it. That'd be cool. No, we, we need to be asking for the things God would ask for, the things Jesus would want me to do and say and go and be if he were me, if he lived where I lived and worked where I worked. If Jesus walked in your shoes this week, what would he say? Where would he go? What would he do? That's his will. And we know from his other teachings on prayer that Jesus sees prayer not primarily about getting things from God. Like, God, I really want you to move this mountain. Do it for me. No, Jesus primarily saw prayer as being with his Father, spending time with him, listening to him, and learning from him. As I've gotten older, what I've found is what I say in prayer is so much less important than what God says in prayer to me. And interestingly enough, a number of religious charlatans who make a mockery of the healing power of God often use doubt or someone's lack of faith as the excuse about what they aren't, why they aren't healed, or why they're struggling, or why their prayer doesn't get answered. We have a good God. I don't think Jesus told his disciples these things to cause anxiety. Just because you keep struggling with doubt and unbelief, that doesn't mean God won't do a miracle. I'm proof of that. I had doubt and unbelief up until the very second she came back into my life. Remember what Jesus said to the father whose son was afflicted with suicidal demons in Mark chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. Jesus said to him, you ask me if I can heal your son. Know this, everything is possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the boy cried out, I want to believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said to him, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. When we don't have faith that can move mountains, we have a good God who takes our unbelief and does miracles. Jesus didn't hold the Father's unbelief against him. The miracles still happened despite his unbelief. My miracles still happened despite my unbelief. God doesn't save us because we believe enough. It's not how much we trust, how much trust we have. It's who we have our trust in that matters. And we've ended every message in this series about trees by praying. Praying the name of God and then breathing out as we make a request to Him. And so we're going to end that way today. Just where you are, quietly in your minds, pray along with me. Jesus, I want to believe. Jesus, help my unbelief. Jesus, help me trust you. Help me trust what you say in these passages. Help me to believe and help me to have faith. Help me to know you are good. Jesus, produce good fruit in me. Produce good fruit through me. Produce good fruit for the good of the world.
Oh, 